I see how that happened. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> She's out of here with yep, the baby. She's, I'm out of here. You keep the kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me pray and we'll get started in our the book of First Peter. Jesus, I thank you for this time we can come together. I just praise you for these kids and what they are learning and how they are, are absorbing your word and getting to know who you are. I just praise you for that. And I just pray for those children as they grow in uh, physically and mentally that they will continue to grow spiritually in your name. And as we come before you this morning, Jesus, I just pray that <clears throat> as a body of believers, we can, we can just put out the distractions of our week and we can just focus on you. Um, help us to bow our hearts and our minds before you this morning as we worship you in, in our message that we are going to be learning from you, in our music, in our time together of fellowship. Lord, I just pray that in all of this, we are focused on you and we praise you, Jesus, for who you are and what you have done for us. We thank you for, for the cross. We thank you for the salvation that you bring. We thank you for your grace and we thank you for your mercy. Jesus, we just praise you. We give you the glory this morning, and we just want to come before you with an attitude of worship. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the book of 1 Peter. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Peter. If not, it will be on the screen. <clears throat> Today we are in chapter 2, verse 11. I had it set up. I don't know what happened. Oh, we had to restart, didn't we? Ah, yeah. We are in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And <clears throat> this is a very kind of short passage, but I think it's a very important passage. All right. Um, we have been talking through 1 Peter, and we have seen Peter explaining to us who we are in Christ. And how our attitude should be in Christ. We are, as the kids said, we are children of God. Amen? Amen. And uh, we are to have an attitude of a child of Christ. And we are to have that in our life. Um, there's two great issues that we learned about throughout this first chapter or first few chapters of First Peter. And those issues of life are that we are, uh, we are living for the glory of God. Do you remember that? We are living for the glory of God. This is important because we are to give God glory and we are living to do that. And we are to help others do that, right? We are to show others our attitude. We should have a different attitude than the world. Amen? Does that make sense? Okay, you're not awake this morning. Everybody raise your hands. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Amen. All right, we are to help others to do the same. We are to help others to live for the glory of God, to give him glory, to worship him, to praise him. Amen? Amen. There we go. You're awake now. <laughs> Great. So if we look at an outline of Peter, 1 Peter, we see that the very first chapters of the book, God is, is God's people amidst suffering, right? So let's kind of reflect a little bit on what we have learned about 1 Peter. Peter is the apostle to the Gentiles, right? And he is writing this to the Gentile Christians. And at the time that he is writing this, they are being persecuted. Christians everywhere are being persecuted. I mean, to the point that people are rounding them up and dragging them to prison because they are not Jews and they are kind of going against what is going on culturally. So the people are being persecuted. So Peter explains in this letter how to be God's people amidst that suffering, amidst that persecution. And we can learn a lot from that because when you look around, we kind of feel like we're persecuted, right? Because the government has kind of pushed out um, things, uh, prayer from the school. Um, they have pushed Christians out. The, the Christian um, morality has been pushed out of our culture. Thank God they're not rounding us up and putting us into prison yet. But we kind of get a, a small, small sense of what was going on. 
So as we start looking at 1 Peter, it, this really kind of shows us how we should be living, how we should be worshiping God. And today we are like go, shifting into the second division of 1 Peter, and it is the conduct of God's people of um, 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 amid suffering it's going to be a day and then we are going to get to chapter 4 and it's going to be the shepherding of God's people amid suffering I'm going to have to take that word out of there it looked good on paper it's just not coming out <clears throat> so 1 Peter 2 11 and 12 this, these two verses actually is one verse in, the, in one sentence in the Greek but two in the translation this is a very important verse section of the of the book these two these two verses it says beloved i urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul keep your conduct among the gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evil doers they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day of visitation all right. So he uses these two words. We've, we've seen these two words before in the first chapter of First Peter. Sojourners and exiles. In the very opening of First Peter, it says to those who are exiles of the dispersion. All right. So remember, the dispersion is when the Christians are like scattered out of Jerusalem. That's the dispersion that he's talking about. So... You are exiles of the dispersion. They're scattered all over the known earth at that point. The known world, the Roman Empire, they are scattered. That's the dispersion. And it, then it says, conduct yourselves with fear among the, throughout the time of your exile. So Peter is saying that you conduct yourself with fear. You're fearing God. You are following God throughout the entire time of your exile. All right? So then we come to this chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Now, these two words are very important for us to understand who we are in our culture, in our society. All right, so sojourner is a temporary resident, an alien. All right, and an exile is a visitor staying briefly. All right, those are, that's what those two Greek words mean. So who are we when we come to who we are in our culture here on earth, we are aliens. We are just temporary residents here. Our residency is where? In the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So he uses this term, beloved. This is kind of a pivoting um, place in this book, and he's kind of changing from talking about who we are are in Christ to how we are to respond to that and how we are to act. So he says, beloved, and this is the beloved of God, okay? It serves as a section divider, and in chapter 1, 2 through 10, God's people amid suffering, right? And now we are turning to how we are to live during that suffering. <clears throat> and then we will look at, uh, in chapter 4, the shepherding of God's people. We are to live as strangers. This is not our home. This is just a temporary hotel that we live in. This is not our home. We have to start thinking about it as this is just temporary. Because our home is in the kingdom of God. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And we need to start having... There should be a space between those two words. <clears throat> we should start having the right attitudes and living the way that God wants us to. And so in verse two, chapter 2, verse 11, it says, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And I want you to notice the language here. It says, I urge you, it literally means to come alongside. All right, that's the literal translation of I urge you. But there's something that you have to understand about this Greek word. If you break that word down to the root of that word, you know what it means? It means Holy Spirit. 
So what he is literally saying is, I urge you, come alongside the Holy Spirit and live the way that we're supposed to. Let the Holy Spirit guide you because you're coming alongside the Holy Spirit. When you come alongside somebody, what does that mean? You encourage them. You are living life together. You are allowing them to help you and guide you. If you come along somebody as a baby Christian and you come alongside them to help them grow, what are you doing? You are discipling them. You are with them. You are helping them. You are helping them to grow in Christ. If you come alongside a friend who is grieving, what are you doing? You are coming alongside to encourage to help let them know you're not you're not alone so when paul urges us i urge you he is literally saying come alongside the holy spirit so that the holy spirit can guide you can comfort you can direct you have you ever heard that before now, it might just be me have you uh, all right let's let's get amen, amen. all right my ears are plugged today, so you've got to be louder. <laughs> I implore or to exhort a personal appeal to respond wholehearted obedience. So Paul is saying, I urge you, I am making an appeal that you come alongside the Holy Spirit and you allow him to guide you and you are wholeheartedly obedient to that. And I want you to notice some more language here. It means to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. <clears throat> In the tense of both of these words, both of these demands, it is a continuing action. So maybe it should, this might be a better translation, all right? Keep, ex keep, ex I can't even say the word. I'm having a hard time with A's today. Keep abstaining from the passions of the flesh because they will continue warring against your soul. All right, so this is not something that just happens once and you're done. This is something that is a continual issue. So you keep abstaining from the passions of the flesh, right? You keep abstaining from the things that <clears throat> cause us to look away from Christ. You keep abstaining from the things that draw you away from the attitude of being with Jesus. And because they are warring against your soul. To abstain, keep away, be distant, be far removed. I heard a story this week that I, I wanted to share. I think it's a pretty good story. This guy, he was interviewing <coughs> some drivers to be his chauffeur. Um, and he interviewed, he had three candidates. He, he, he narrowed the field down to three candidates. He talked to the first candidate, and he said, tell me how you will keep me safe chauffeuring me around. And the gentleman, he says, I am such a great driver. If there was a cliff, I could be going 60 miles an hour, and I would have you stopped within a yard of that cliff, and you would be fine. That's how good of a driver I am. That's how I can keep you safe. Second driver comes in, and he kind of has the same thing, and he says, how are you going to keep me safe? driving me around and the driver says well I could be going 70 miles an hour if there was a cliff I could have you stop 12 inches from that cliff every time and not go over that's how safe you are when I'm driving the third driver comes in and he says I am such an excellent driver I wouldn't have you anywhere near that cliff that's how I will keep you safe how do you think that job went yeah, I'm thinking number three. So <clears throat> I think that there's a lot of times when people kind of flirt with this idea of how close to the line can I get? How close to the line can I get without sinning against God? And that's where they want to live. And I'll tell you that Satan is warring against our souls. When we get up to that line, he is working overtime because he knows that we'll eventually step over that line. Does that make sense? So he is saying to abstain, keep away from, be distant, be far removed. 
<clears throat> and this idea of warring, I want you to look at this Greek word here. You might recognize some of the way that it's written. It's fight, war, wage war, engage in battle. And it <clears throat> our two words, strategy and strategize, come from this Greek word. All right? So when you think about Satan is warring against our souls, think about this. That war looks like this. He is strategizing. He is trying to come up with a strategy to make you stumble. He is trying to come up with this strategy <clears throat> where if you are on that line and you are flirting with this idea of where this line is, that's his strategy. He is going to be using that, <clears throat> and he's going to be saying, ah, it's just a little sin. It's just, it's no big deal. You're right here. It won't, it won't be a big deal. And he is strategizing using the, the things that are the passions and the desires of our flesh. And he is using those as a strategy to make us fall away from Jesus. Or at the very least, he is using those to distract us from our mind being on Jesus. Does that make sense? Why are the desires so important? Entertaining evil desires, even if those desires are never acted upon, take our focus off of Christ and turn our hearts from heavenly to earthly desires. All evil actions begin with a single thought. All earth evil actions begin with a single thought. So when we, he is waging war against us, remember it is a present tense waging war it's always happening and when we allow ourselves to start thinking about maybe these evil desires and we start like stepping closer and closer to that line we've already taken our mind off of Jesus we've already taken our thoughts and let the evil desires let the Satan the evil one begin to use his strategy against us but now that we know his strategy, what can we do? We can abstain from that. We can back away from that line, and we can focus more on Jesus. In Philippians, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any worthy of praise, think on these things. So in Philippians, Paul is telling us, keep your mind on these things. Remember, Satan is strategizing against you, but our strategy to fight him is to focus on Jesus, to focus on the good, the pure, the heavenly. And that is how we continue to focus on Jesus and stay away. That's how we back away from that line. Maintaining the right desires. Keep your mind on things above. Remember, you are only a visitor here. You are only a visitor here on earth. Our home is with God. Amen. Our residence is in the kingdom of, G of heaven. Do the things that are necessary to grow in Christ. Rub shoulders with like-minded people. When evil desire arises, what do we do? We flee from them. Remember the verse, resist the devil and he will flee. He has a strategy, but so do we. We resist the devil and he will flee from us. Because when we resist the devil, we are focused on Jesus, not on his evil desires. And when we are focused on Jesus, we have more power than he does. We have the Holy Spirit because we come alongside the Holy Spirit in our life, amen? amen? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me than that evil one that is trying to tempt us. Greater is he that is in me than that line that is there. We back away from that line because God urges us to focus on whatever is pure, whatever is holy whatever is worthy of praise. 
We are to live as strangers. It is evidenced in right action. So in verse 12, it says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. Have you ever had somebody that spoke against you or, or said something about you that was against your character? It doesn't feel good, does it? But the idea is, when people do that, the people that they're talking to know you and see you, and they know you well enough that they know that's not the character that I see. That's not what I see. I see that they are different. I see that they are God-fearers. I see that they are Christ followers, and they would never do something like this. They see your character because of who you are in Christ. We have a different character in Christ than they do in the world. And people will see that because our actions are different, right? We come up to that line and then we back away. We don't want to cross that line. We want to come alongside the Holy Spirit and let him guide and direct us and encourage us and take care of us. We are believers in Christ. And we don't want to let those evil desires of the flesh be in our mind and take control of us. We want to focus on Jesus. Honorable. Good, beautiful, appropriate, noble, free from defect. Pleasant, morally good. God is not simply concerned with our profession of a godly life, but your possession of a godly life, right? God wants us to have a godly life. We are to be glorifying him. That's what we're here for. That's what we have learned throughout chapter one and the first part of chapter two, is we are to be glorifying God. That is what we were created for, is to glorify, give God the glory, give God the worship, Peter talks about this in chapter 3, and we'll get to that a little bit deeper as we get into 1 Peter. But your hearts honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for your hope that is in you. Yet do not do it with gentleness and respect. All right, we're going to dig deeper into that verse as we get to it. But I want to point out to this. It doesn't mean that you have all the answers. All right? This verse doesn't mean that you have all the answers of what happens. It just means you are to share the hope that you have in Christ. The why you have that hope. That's what Peter is talking about here. He says, always be prepared to give an answer for the reason that you have the hope in Jesus Christ. And remember, that's not... That, that's not worldly hope. That is biblical hope. That is biblical hope built on solid evidence and a solid foundation of who God is. That's where our hope comes from. Our hope is in Jesus Christ because he came, he walked on this earth, he died on this earth, but he also rose on this earth and he is our living Savior. And that's where our hope comes from. Amen? Amen. All right, you guys are still awake. Great. <laughs> Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We, talked, we just talked about that. You don't have to do anything. You just have to live a godly life. And when somebody talks against you, they're going to be put to shame because people know who you are. And here in Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. People will see what you're doing. People will know you are Christians because of your love for God. And that love for God is also a love for others, amen? Because we are to help others see who Jesus is. We are helped to help others see who God is. We are to live as strangers. It results in praise to God. 
Remember chapter 1 and first part of 2. We are to give God the glory. We are to give God the praise. That's how we are to live our lives. And here in chapter 2, verse 12, it says, and, the, and glorify the God on the day of visitation. What does it mean on the day of visitation? There's two, there's two thoughts on what the day of visitation is, all right? The first one is um, a position or an office, overseer, bishop, or an elder, all right? So <clears throat> here is the idea. That's what that word means is visitation. Here are the two views of what the day of visitation is. On judgment day, you will stand before God and will be forced to acknowledge God. All right? So that's the first, that's the first view. The second view is a day when God becomes the overseer of your life. All right? So the day that you were converted from being um, non-Christian to Christian, right? The day that you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior... That is the day of visitation where the Holy Spirit comes in and you are coming alongside with him and living that way. So those are the two most popular views. I have my view. I think it's the second one. I don't know if you agree with me or not. We can talk about that sometime. Yeah, but when you look at the content of the book and what's talking about I believe that the second view makes the most sense, in my opinion. Okay, so here's what I want to challenge you with today. Here's our application. Live by the rules of the kingdom, God's kingdom. Live by the rules of God's kingdom. I know that <clears throat> when we start talking about rules and things like that, that kind of has a negative tone to it. So as I was thinking about this, let's... Live by the teachings of Jesus. Does that sound better? Live by the teachings of Jesus because we want to become more like Jesus. Together. Right? That makes sense. Live as though our bodies are our servants, not that we are their servant. Right? We are the master of our bodies. Our bodies are not the master of us. Which means when it comes to living by the flesh, we have the power over that because we have come alongside the Holy Spirit and we are following the teachings of Jesus. We are the master of our bodies, not our bodies are the master of us. That's what I want to challenge you with. Live with the understanding that our lives will influence others. When we have Jesus in our lives and we are living alongside the Holy Spirit, our attitudes change. Whether you believe it or not, our attitudes change. And we start living the life that Jesus wants us to live. Our actions are going to influence others. And we live to glorify God. Amen? Amen. The two important issues. Glorifying God. Helping others to glorify God. That's the issues of our life. And as we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and guide and direct us, we start living as strangers here on earth because our home is in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we come before you this morning and we want to worship. We want to give you the glory. We want to thank you for who you are and what you have done for us. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of following. You are worthy of being our God. And we thank you for that. You are the most powerful, omniscient God. And we thank you that you have brought us in as your children. Thank you for saving us. Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to our time of communion this morning, we have communion on each side of the, of the chapel here. As this song, this next video plays, as you feel led, I want you to go to the tables and take communion. And I 
want you to think about and reflect on living a life that Jesus wants us to live. Jesus died on that cross. These symbols represent, this bread represents his body. The juice represents his blood. And every time we take this, we are thinking and we are reflecting on Jesus. And my challenge for you today is to reflect on Jesus and our life. And are we living a life that is glorifying God? Are we living a life that looks like we are strangers here on earth, but we are welcome in the kingdom of God? As we listen to this song and we take this communion, please reflect on that. Jesus, as we come before you this morning and we take communion, Lord, I just pray that you will touch our lives. I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict us where we need to be convicted and we can reflect on that so that we can come alongside the Holy Spirit and live that life that you want us to live. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are stars.